What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. Uh, super pumped on tonight's episode. I've been very busy. I uh, haven't been putting out two episodes a week, so I apologize for that. We're going to jump back into that in the fall when I have a little bit more time, but trying to bring y'all one episode a week. And uh, we've got uh, kind of some transition months ahead of us as far as fishing goes. We've got warm, hot summer water temperatures right now and hot days. And, um, you know, we're, we're just around the corner from like some cooler, some cooler north breeze and some, some changing in, the, in what the fish's habits are. So um, I think it's a great time to really dig into some of the, you know, the speckled trout and the redfish and the flounder and kind of how they transition um, throughout the year. And uh, staying on top of those fish is, is and, and catching those fish is, is uh, gets a little bit tougher. But then once you kind of figure out the changes and the trends that are going on, um, it can uh, it can be a lot easier to catch them, I believe, in the fall. But um, that's enough of me rambling right now. I'm going to go through go through the other pre-show stuff real quick. If you haven't checked out our Facebook group, Eastern Current Fishing, go check that out. Uh, check out our Patreon account if you want some extra content, uh, some weekly kind of tips on there, and uh, it's uh, that will be linked in the show notes on the podcast platforms as well as on the YouTube channel. So you can go check that out. And uh, I got my boy Will Jones from Beaufort, North Carolina on here tonight. I'm going to bring him up. And uh, what's going on, man? Howdy. Howdy, howdy. I, uh, I'm i excited about this episode. I'm itching to to get up there and do a little big drum fishing here soon. And, and uh, I think it's uh, I think it's due time to do a, a podcast about it. I mean, I've heard that there's a few that have been caught already. Yeah, I, 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 there's not a lot of people catching a lot of them on purpose yet, but there's yeah. some. Um, I did hear a couple reports today. Um, my crowd today, I was fishing a two boat trip with Andy Bates Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, we fished with him yesterday and I I took the uh, daughter and the dad and kind of just put them on some trout and stuff. Uh, they, they wanted more volume and Andy went hero zero and we didn't catch any old drum that yesterday or today, but it's coming soon. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, It's a got to be so tempting up there this time of year. Like when you're running around, maybe your your plan to go catch trout's not panning out very well. It's like, you know, it's the same deal with like the North Carolina tarpon or something like that. It's like it draws you in. It might not be time to go check it out, but it draws you in from uh, from maybe something else you should be doing. I, that happens to me down here all the time too. I'll start out trout fishing in the morning, and because we get them off our off our jetties and some of the near shore wrecks, and when it's slow, I'm like, ah, let's go see if we can catch a big red fish. And we go out there and just pull them. Uh, white daughter sharks all morning but it's it's fun for a second until you realize it's a shark but yeah man that's uh that's exciting what when do you really start focusing on on targeting those fish really soon last year we were catching them um the last week of july um and i would say it really peaks late in august like second half of august most years like if you look back the best catches i've had when they start to get consistent right around the middle of august like late in the third week of august somewhere in there um but we start we start looking for them either on our days off or here and there when we're fishing up there i start fishing up on the news i fish down here at the coast most of the time mm-hmm. and i start fishing up on the news intentionally late july early august that way i'm up there and i'm seeing what's going on and uh go you know after i fish with my clients or uh you know, a, a day that I'm not booked, which hopefully is not very often, but, <laughs> uh, you know, do we go and, and scout for them a little bit and then yeah. we're up there fishing up there and then we get these opportunities and catch a couple incidentally while we're trout fishing. I caught one the other day on a DOA shrimp with a little battle 2000. It was pretty awesome. That's awesome. I think I saw that post, man. That's pretty cool. You hang into <laughs> it and you think it's a citation trout and then you realize very quickly it's much larger. <laughs> Um, as soon as we start catching them, you know, in decent numbers, we just we do that all the way through September. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. When, when does it feel like the last of like the consistency is out of there? Is that the end of September? Um, we you I, I you in the past I've always kind of the last week or so in September if I have a few tough days I just co- start coming back down here. Yeah, but the guys that are guide out of the noose all the time, like that live in New Bern, live in Oriental, they they've caught them in, well into October. Wow. the last few years yeah you know, that's but awesome I, you know i come back down here and do the albies and the trout and the puppy drum and the on the flats here and uh so i don't need to stay up there yeah but uh, some whenever they whenever i come back down here and i'm trout fishing and then i look at their posts and they're like still catching big drum like <laughs> yeah for sure so tell me a little bit about the transition of these fish i, I get asked that question a lot and I, I think we've got fish that go south and go offshore and um 
whatnot. But what what are your kind of beliefs of the the migration patterns of these big redfish when they're not in the sound and in the river? So I don't want to I don't want to make it sound like I think I'm an expert or anything. Yeah. You're more I of an think, expert than I am. <laughs> I think in in Onslow Bay, which is Cape Fear, where y'all yep. are at, up to Cape Lookout, I think we get a few fish that come up from your way because y'all catch them out there. There's probably some kind of spawning population out there. We get a few fish that come up towards Cape Lookout and a few fish that come out of Raleigh Bay, which is Hatteras, down to Cape Lookout. And we they get cross Cape Lookout and we catch a few of them out in the ocean in the spring and the fall, sometimes the winter. Um, they're they're pretty deep in the winter time. You're not usually gonna catch like guys like me anyways aren't usually gonna catch them in 50, 60 foot of water or less in the winter time. But then the sp- spring and fall, if there's bait out there, we catch them. Um, once the water warms up, they push back in, start feeding on bait. I've caught them as 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 cold as 57, 58. Wow. In the ocean, and then they do they do their thing out in the ocean until like June, July, and then they start creeping. And a lot of them kind of hang out near Hatteras and Oak Cook Inlet the whole time uh, so a lot of them don't make it all the way down here and then they start making their way towards the inlets and kind of going in and out of the inlet from what i see from what i can tell and then yeah um then they they kind of start pushing in with, like we start catching the old drum way up pamlico sound and in the noose river um when we start getting a lot of menhaden and gotcha. we start getting more big menhaden we already yeah. have a lot of menhaden in there and we'll catch old drum on that. We'll catch them chasing mullet. I've seen them chase flounder. They eat them like fruit roll ups. It's pretty cool. <laughs> that is cool. You see, you see them jumping, and then they and then they turn in the air like this. You go, and you're like, oh, that's a flounder. <laughs> there, and you pop the cork one time, and you know. But um, that's yeah, really so they, cool. July, yeah, they start going in, and then it's like it's like a trickle. Yeah. And there's still, there's guys that had are still sight casting them every now and then. The guys uh, even up at Oregon and lit back in the sound or seeing them in the sound, catching some in the sound, Cedar Island, and then they really just push in hard late August. Yeah. I mean, we 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 it's yeah, it gets more consistent late August. But well, let's talk like a little bit of, oh, sorry. Sorry, what were you saying? Uh like I said last year and the year before we were catching them all almost all the way up to Newburn in late July. So there, there's obviously more to it than what we think. It's some yeah. pretty nuanced. That or we've been just leaving them up there all up river for years and never even knew they were there. I, but I, I don't know. Yeah, you think some guys striper fishing or trout fishing would hang a few more of them though? And they have, they yeah. Have, but I mean, there's a, there's been I mean some of my best days were last year in late July. Really? So well, I don't know. Yeah, that's cool. I, I've started to see a few caught down here in the ocean on the jetties and the nearshore wrecks and whatnot. And like you said, there's always a few hanging around, but it seems like our best bite is like maybe when they start to trickle out of the sound and move south um, out, out of out of Pamlico, we start to hit them in like October or November pretty good. Um, and September can be pretty good as well. Um, but but not they from here to go there. I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't. I wish there was more tagging of those big redfish. There's really, I don't think there's much study on the migratory patterns of, of those fish. And I know Cobia, there's like two populations I've heard where there's like a Gulf population, like a, a population of fish that kind of moves in and out. And then a Southern population that moves South and North. And I feel yeah. like we got to have some of that with the redfish too. They're kind of blending all, all back and forth. It would be really interesting to have more studies on it. I know they, they tag, um, and they have tagged a, a decent amount in the past. I don't know if they've done enough to really figure out exactly what's going on or if they like, came to some kind of conclusion and they're like, Oh, we don't need to tag anymore. But, um, I'm, I'm tagging for them. some. yeah, um, I doing it last year, I've only gotten a couple of recaptures. They'll go at large for like 19 years. George Beckwith tagged one in 2000 and it went at, it was at large for 19 years. And somebody recaptured it last year, grew one inch. Really? <laughs> Golly, that's I crazy. I, I, pull, I don't think I could pull it up right now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> buried in there too far but do guys catch them up that way like in the dead of winter is anybody you know off off grouper fishing or anything like that and catching them in deep water yep they do they catch them pretty well what's That's the what's the depth that they or what are some of the deeper depths you've, you've heard of people catching them at bottom fishing i've heard of people catching them like 120 really wow yeah. i've heard of guys trolling for for bluefin as well in the winter time yep. and catching them trolling which is crazy i think that <laughs> i think that is actually pretty common. Like it's not like common. you can catch them every time you go out, but it happens. I think most of the guys that bluefin tuna fish a lot have caught them. Like yeah. That. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sixty foot in like November, December, you know, or yeah. or like late December or something, you know. But those fish yeah. in deep water mark so well. Like that would be kind of a cool little wintertime fishery if you could figure out where you could run out and jig those big bull redfish in the winter. 
Uh, yep. ne- never give them a break. Yep. Just beat on them all year. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about how you like to target these fish. I know a lot of people, and it's important to really focus. I mean, in any fishing, fish around the bait that those fish want to feed on, those menhaden, those mullet. Um, so take me through kind of what that looks like. But then also, if you get out there one day and like, sometimes the bait's not on the surface, you know, and you're not marking much of it. What, what's your go-to plan if you can't really key in on where the bait is? So uh, the textbook Old Drum 101 fishing for you know on artificial lures that's mostly what i do i yeah. grew up fishing for them with bait i like doing that um i'm gonna start doing it more again um because there's so many people doing out there doing it now and you just, I just have to be a little more versatile than i was the last few years but anyways right. so textbook is you're riding you so there's there's generally in the news we're lucky that we have lots of shoals that run out into the middle of the river and it's just like it's just like when you're fishing in the marsh for slot reds and there's a point yeah, you know they're probably gonna be. Yeah, it's just like that in the news. You get these shoals that run way out, and you get these like six to eight, or like ten to twelve, or, or a lot of times it's like ten to fourteen foot sho- like drop offs in these shoals, and that's where you know they're gonna want to be. That's where you're gonna set up when you're gonna chunk bait for them. Yeah, I try to find big schools of menhaden because they're not gonna travel really fast, and they're easy to fish. They're easy to fish around, and they spin, and they don't really go anywhere. Um, and I try to find big schools of Menhaden and near those those shoals, sloughs, those areas that I think the drum are going to be and kind yeah. of travel down and if try, find both those ingredients. And if you see them on top and they look nervous, you're going to throw popping corks mainly is what we mo- mostly use, well, we, though we do catch them on subsurface baits. Um, it's start, I, I've started doing it a little bit more, and it, that's working a little bit better for me now, but mainly the popping corks because you're just making it sound like another drum feeding. Big nasty popping cord, big nasty pop, pretty long pause, probably longer than you do for a slot drum and right. trout. Up like a good five, six, seven seconds. I mean, let it sit there, let them, because it's loud, and then pop it again, and you fish it all the way to your rod tip. You, even if the bait ball is a full cast away, you fish it all the way to your rod tip. Or if there's bait balls all around you and they're out of casting range, you still fish it to your rod tip, and pop it one more time, and then lift it slowly out of the water because <laughs> they'll come and eat it. You know, cause it takes them a while to find it sometimes. Yeah, definitely. And you don't want to draw that redfish from who knows how far they come. Right. You don't want to draw them away to the boat and then rip it out and then cast away over there. So you fish it slowly back to the boat, pop it really hard, and then you just keep pounding these bait balls, and that's what we try to do. Sometimes there's baits on the surface, like you said, where I use my side scan. I kind of go to these likely areas, and I kind of start idling around and shoot the side scan out. My, my Lorance will go over 300 feet away. You can't you can't see enough detail, and you get a strong enough return past that. So about set it to like two fifty, three hundred, maybe three fifty, and I'm shooting way out of the side, and I just kind of idle through. And if I start seeing a lot of bait in an area that that uh, that I want to fish, I'll at least do a drift there. Yeah. You know, you do start to set up a wind drift, and I always try to approach an area from upwind. That way, I can just turn the motor off and just and start work drifting. through it. No, you don't have to idle up. through it. No, is yeah. So you don't have to go all the way around and come back around and do all that crap. You just you come, you run around the area, you run you know deep in the middle of the river, or you go shallow, of the, you know and get up into the spot you want to check out. Start idling through, and then if you start marking bait or seeing, but sometimes you like if there's texture on the surface, sometimes there's nasty bait balls spinning and you don't see them until you slow down. Just like when you're you know when you're pulling a flat or something looking right. for a slot red if you slow down you'll start seeing more stuff definitely so same kind of thing and then the side scan all that um and uh so that's you know and then sometimes we'll bl- catch them in scattered bait where you just see a flip here a flip there um i don't like this time of year early i don't like to fish scattered bait yeah it, i'm only going to look for the best situations this time of year because it's early yeah but once once it, they once the fish push in really good and we're catching them pretty much every day and you know if some of the big bait schools that i was fishing the day before are gone but there's still some scattered bait i'll fish that area then go to another area fish an area with scattered bait and there's some there are some little sloughs and and points and stuff that that are just likely spots that will catch them pretty, almost completely in the blind with barely any bait yeah. luckily the noose has a ton of bait in it this time of year so we're almost never fishing with no bait mm-hmm. there's mm-hmm. always some mullet or, or something you know and just always keep your eye out for anything you'll see them you'll see them cruise you'll see one bust you'll see um, mullet that are jumping a lot more frantically, 
like I said, I think I, I don't know if I said this on the podcast earlier, but I, I know I told you earlier, maybe before we were recording, but yeah. they'll, they'll chase Flounder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so awesome. It's crazy. I uh, I might have to start using Flounder's live bait. If you, I guess, if you're targeting during flounder season, you can do it. It's like a flu ro- <laughs> roller. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I might already said that. I don't know, but I, I know that's the trouble with the pre-show. Talking too much pre-show, you start to forget what you said then and what you said during the podcast. So hey, if it's good information, we can just repeat it twice. Um, well, I think that was huge. What you said about you know trying to set yourself up up when same deal as if you're trying to sight fish, you're always trying to set yourself up on a bank, come into the area where you've got the sun behind you, so you can see well. Um, and just thinking about those things ahead of time are really going to play into you know a more successful day on the water. So talk to me a little bit about the the cadence of the bait because you're talking about nervous bait up on the surface or like if you roll up on a on a bait ball, can you almost sometimes tell just by looking at how the bait's acting if there's fish on it? Yeah. Um, so sometimes they'll be up. They're like they're feeding on the surface. Like this big menhaden will feed on the surface and. And they'll be up there with tails out of the water, acting pretty frantic, just feeding. But but uh, if there's fish on them, especially like around the same time we get the big drum in thick, we start getting some bigger bluefish instead of those little snappers that the noose has, the yeah. little teeny one. You start getting some decent sized ones, kind of like the ones we catch down here at the Cape. And they'll push the menhaden too. Um, but you'll see them showers and going. Yeah. You know. Just like just like if you're Kobe fishing a bait ball in the ocean. Honestly, the the old drum fishing is like. It's like Kobe fishing with a popping cork in the river. It's, yeah, it's yeah. similar. Um, but uh, yeah, you can see them shower, and you can see them. Uh, um, they they just they, they push up more on the top instead of just like barely making a wake like finger mullet make. They'll be they'll have their tails just hanging out of the water. Yeah, you know? like they don't want to be in the water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they 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 wish they were birds at that point. <laughs> yeah, take yeah, off and, then and you'll fly see away. Some jump. You'll see some jump way out of the water and flip, you know, they're like they're spooked or something, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so definitely. All right. So if there's no bait, if you're out there looking for bait, are you just gonna set yourself up in the same drifts on those shoals, just fish the areas that historically you know those fish are there? But we'll, all right, let, let's here's a better question. If if it's your first time there, can't find any bait, yeah, what are you look question. what are you looking for? So the the first thing I'll Because the noose needs more people up there fishing <laughs> during right, old drum right. season. <laughs> So the first instinct I would say is it might sound like a crappy answer, but I would just say keep riding. Yeah. Keep looking. Keep riding until you find bait. Gotcha. Yep. And even if you know, even if you only find, you know, peanut menhaden, uh, marking on the side scan, and you see one flip every now and then, caught plenty of drum in situations like that. If you can find that near a decent shoal that comes off of the the bank or just a drop off in some of the areas in the noose, especially the upper river have a ledge that just parallels the shoreline it might not be a shoal that sticks out but you'll have these flats that come out and then you go from like one foot two foot and then like four and then it'll be like three four foot way out and then it goes boom down to like six and eight and if you can find if you can fish bait like a little bit of bait around like a ledge like that that helps a lot yeah um but so yeah you can ride until you find something better now if you can't find any bait i mean um, usually can like I said you can find some mullet jumping you can usually find some finger mullet some some shrimp jumping or something but if you can't find anything just try to drift try to go like check, look at your wind direction and, and look at the chart and see like what shoals are parallel to the wind and drift in that like 8 10 foot and cast out to the deep and cast out to the shallow and cast down the down the break and just blind cast because it works yeah um, yeah gets to that point and it's like late august september when there's a lot of fish around i mean you will be better off fishing bait in that situation but if you really want to catch them on lures you definitely can blind cast um sloughs that are near the short layers of areas not going to give any of them away a lot of them my people already know but there are areas where the shoreline has a slough running down it and there's shoals offshore and you can catch them in there uh, you can also kill two birds with one stone by fishing like a big oval shaped popping cork and a doa shrimp and just be ready to accidentally hook an old drum. You can do that, and then catch yeah. some trout and some slot reds as bycatch in those same areas. But um, yeah, just drift, drift those shoals. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that has worked. You know, I, I I can't think of that many times. I mean, it definitely has happened. I can't think of that many times where I wasn't seeing any bait. Yeah. Uh, it, even if it, like I said, just a little bit of scattered bait or something, some yeah. kind of light. <laughs> some kind of life, yeah. Look for life. Look for even birds. Some birds working something. If there's yeah, birds yeah. dipping, there's probably some bait around. 
the times that I've been up there and struggled more is in the nastier conditions where it's, you know, I feel like side scan is so important out there because even if you're if you're in eight feet of water, you're really not going to down scan much bait. You can side scan yeah. it. So that, that that's huge. I don't have side scan, but I would love to get side scan for a lot of scenarios down here as well. Tells uh, the whole story. Yeah, it tells the whole story for sure. Can you now? Can you pick up the drum pretty well on that when they're thick on a bait ball? A little bit. Most uh, it seems like for some reason. I mean, just the most of the situations I'm in, I I imagine what's going on down there. You can't see the water's black, but I imagine what's going on down there. Most of the time we're catching them. It's like you got these bait bo- bait pods everywhere, and some of them are pushed up on top. Maybe they're not. And the fit, there might be a bunch of drum there, but I, I don't see them really schooled up that much. I mean, every now and then they'll come up in a group and bust, but I think they're just milling around everywhere on their own. Just got like it might be a school, but there'll be these areas that have bait and these big shoals could be multiple football fields, the size of multiple football fields, and the fish are all scattered out. Yeah, and you definitely. drift through, and just that's why that's why the popping cord is so effective because I mean it's a much to- larger presence in the water. You know yeah. the noise. Like, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, that's that's one thing I always share with any time that I'm blind casting is I, I want to fish a bait that's either going to be seen well, it's got a lot of flash, or vibration, or Pop. noise, something. But yeah, the popping cork. <laughs> um, yeah. I had a buddy that fished with with Bear Holman down in Louisiana. He's a, a captain out of Florida and in Louisiana, yeah. and they throw the popping cork in Louisiana a bunch. And yeah. his name is Will Huffine, and he was telling me the story one time. He's like we were throwing the popping cork and my buddy wanted to throw the fly rod, but it wasn't the right conditions. And, and bear turned to him and said, when you're tired of throwing poppy, keep throwing poppy. <laughs> so <laughs> never, never put poppy down. Just keep popping poppy. But man, I'll tell you what, that'll wear your shoulder out, your shoulders, yeah. your wrists. Is there any for the, for the fatigued fishermen, any tips on a way to, to work the popping cork that that's not quite as rough on your shoulders and your elbows and your wrists? Um, I, I, I fish a, I think the, um, we haven't talked about this yet. We don't have to talk about it a lot because it's kind of boring, but the, the tackle that you, I think that's important. People love that. So I think we should have a tackle. Yeah, it is. You want to buy You want to, I mean, this, this is a, these are big fish on relatively light tackle. You don't want to go buy a Walmart combo and go out there and try to test your luck. Those rods also spend most of your money on a rod, get a pretty decent reel. I like the reels. You don't have to get a pin battle. I like the reels at least that expensive. I use the spin fishers, yeah. uh, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm experimenting with a couple other ones because I think at some point I might go get on the Daiwa program, but I like the spin fisher sixes a lot. So they're, mm-hmm. they're pretty or whatever. Anyways, 3,500, 4,500 size reel, 30 pound braid, um, seven foot to seven foot six, medium heavy. You want it to be pretty fast. That way when you pop it, it's not bending too much. Yeah. And that you're wasting all that energy. Um, and, and I think what I was going to say before I got on this tangent was a long rod butt that you can kind of that you kind of tuck. You're holding it like this, and that rod butt. Use your is, back of your forearm a little bit. Yeah, the, the, rod, the long rod butt that's going to go on the back of your your uh, forearm, and you're going to on the end of your cast, the first half of your cast, you're popping up with that rod tucked in there. Gotcha. It's so like a quick pop like this, and when it starts getting closer to the boat, then you stick that rod butt across your body and kind of use your body as like a lever gotcha like a whatever gotcha yeah, yeah. um and, and a bit like that and then you pop it down when you get close to the boat and like i said you pop it to your rod tip and wait a second and pull it up slowly <laughs> yeah <laughs> they'll, hit it. they'll hit it they'll come out of the water and hit your head on the boat i mean it's crazy how often when you're cork fishing do you have them eat the cork instead of the the soft plastic at first a good amount of the time um it's frustrating but not i mean they usually eat the jig. They will hit the cork, and some people are like, you put like a hook on the cork, but then you do that, and then they eat the jig. When you hook that fish, another fish eats the jig, and you they separate. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Which that happens quite a lot when you, when most of the time you get a cork bite is actually when you hook a fish, and there's other fish with them. They're following them, and they see that cork, and they hit the cork, and then yeah. you bust them. Yeah. So. I've had that happen a good number of times. There was one scenario in Louisiana one year. This was my first year guiding down there. And it was – I'd never, I've never seen it like this since an inshore. I've seen the fish get like this out in the open water pretty good. But, I mean, there was menhaden in this one bay. It's so thick you could walk across. There was no schools. It was just like a massive, you know, probably 200-acre bay yeah. full of menhaden, full of redfish. You'd throw a, a cork out there and just barely twitch it and you'd have a fish on. 
Um, and this is the first time I had ever been, had ever been bit off because of fish eating the cork. And so we'd hook a fish, and you take off, you know, and then like ten fish in a row, we didn't land a single fish. We kept getting broken off. And then we're like, well, yep. let's let's tie. We ended up putting like eighty pound on, and we were still losing some fish because there were so many. Every time we'd get one fish back, we had foam corks smashed to pieces. Like you couldn't even use them again. They'd just been eaten so many times in water. But it's it's crazy when they when they get aggressive, man. It, it can be silly. Now one more funny story about the cork is uh, one time I was on a school out out in some open water down there, and we uh, we broke a cork off on one. We had just we had caught a, a good number of fish and. We just took the hooks off and we're just pitching corks to them and just like playing with the fish up on the surface. And one broke the cork off. And so the cork, you know, a fish had taken it down. He let it go before it could even get up to the surface. Another fish was coming over and eating it. And finally it found its way to the surface and was sitting there on the top for a while. And like four or five redfish swam up to it. And we're just looking at it. And one <laughs> fish nudged the cork. And as soon as it moved, another fish ate it. And the whole thing started over again. I'm trying to eat it before it got to the surface. I mean, it was it was way better than catching a fish. We were just sitting there filming it. I got a video on my phone. I'll send it to you when we're done with this. But it's it's pretty freaking hilarious. They're uh, they're very aggressive when they get in the school. It's uh it's it's fun. I'm I'm jonesing to get up there. I think I'm gonna come up there for a couple of days and and stay in Oriental and do a little fishing this year because I I miss catching redfish of size. <laughs> I'm tired of catching a little puppy drum. Um, we'll do. Whenever you come up here, let me know. Maybe we can go fish or something. Yeah, definitely, man. I would love to. I would love to. I'll keep you posted. I think I'm going to wait a little bit later when things slow down here. Maybe do like early September and come up there oh, and do definitely. it. But. If, you, if you're going to make a trip out of it, you should wait till it's peak. Come up here when it's peak. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Like right before or right after Labor Day weekend, you know, and uh, yeah. I mean, if you because if, if you come up a little early, you might hit it really good, but you also might go home with a zero. Yeah, big zero. Yeah, for sure. I just like getting on the water up there anyways. But t- tell me this a little bit about if you're not fishing a cork, you talked about, you know, sometimes you're fishing some some subsurface lures, excuse me, some subsurface lures. Um, are there any specific things you like to throw? I've heard rattle traps can be can be good, but are you just throwing big paddle tails or soft plastics as well? Um, yeah, the, so when I don't throw them a whole lot, um, I don't throw the subsurface stuff a whole lot. Unless I see like the bait ball spinning on top, like the like we were talking about earlier, the textbook old drum 101, the best. I throw it, I throw those under there sometimes under the bait balls, like throw past, let it sink down to the bottom, jig it up off the bottom, like yo yo it up off the bottom. Um, but sometimes I will, like when we're doing those big wind drifts with scattered bait, sometimes I'll throw a jig or a rattle trap while my clients are throwing the popping cork, yeah, and and just to like try something different, and uh, and you just make these long casts, like kind of ahead of the drift that way you're not dragging it behind the boat once you drift away, and you just yo-yo that rattle trap and it goes up off the bottom and then you reel up the slack and you try to you keep line taut and then let it fall hit the bottom and you go rip it off the bottom and then reel the slack real fast and then let it hit the bottom and and sometimes when you have a the, just the perfect speed wind drift where it's not too fast and not too slow i'll drag it behind the boat and i'll just be sitting there at my console while my clients are casting the corks ahead of the boat and, and popping or casting at bay balls and if we have a decent wind drift i'll just pull it forward and let it fall back <laughs> a little jig control yep yeah, the rattle trap is pretty self-explanatory you fish it just like you would fish it for other stuff but yeah you can do it you can do a jig too you just upscale it a lot from what you do for slot drum and trout like like an ounce or a, it, like i've used half ounce but what i find is when you're fishing 15 foot of water 10 foot of water it it you can you can keep bottom contact, but those drums don't care what the fall rate is really. Yeah, they so, just they just want it's easy to pass their face. They just need to see. Easier to fish a one ounce. You just chunk yeah. it out there and just and just fish it like a jig, like for for trout or whatever, and, yeah. and they'll thump. Yeah, I'd rather cast it into a bait ball. Yeah, but you can cat you can kind of you know fan cast too and catch them like that. So is there is there a depth that's too deep to target them on artificial, or is there a depth that's too shallow? So I used to think so, but the noose only gets the noose only gets like 22 to 25 foot deep in the very middle, uh, mainly 22, 18, that kind of thing. And you know, I don't, I, I, I caught some a few years ago out in the middle of the river on popping corks on bait that was marked on the bottom and a little bit showing on top, and that kind of changed my whole perspective on the thing, how how effective the cork was. And then last year we caught a ton of fish. I don't know what happened. Actually, it happened the last two years. 
we caught tons of fish out in the middle of the river when the menhaden I don't, I don't know if it was the dissolved oxygen levels or whatever but the bait just quit hanging out on the shoals the big bait balls and was hanging out in the middle of the river only in the middle of the river in 18 20 foot of water and we were catching a lot of fish wow. in those baits so that's yeah. awesome i mean you can eat deep you know yeah you catch definitely. a shallow three feet but we fish mainly i'd say most of the fish we catch on the corks is like 10 to 15 feet yeah 10 to 15 feet now if you're up shallow and you're cork fishing are you popping it a little bit lighter or are you still hammering down on it pretty good i still fish i still fish the big nasty blabber mouse a lot and i pop it really hard i think they're i think in certain situations the uh, smaller cork might be better yeah i haven't really i haven't really seen enough evidence but um I, I didn't. I have noticed that when I'm fishing up river and there, and we're, the farther up river you go, the size of Menhaden seem to get smaller, and you're mm-hmm. fishing a lot of really dense schools of peanut Menhaden, a little two or three inch Menhaden, and the bites are lighter. I've noticed that when I go up there, I need to order a bunch of those uh, foam. Um, I've I've been disappointed with a lot of the foam ones in the past, but like the um, the new one was that Is called the Paradise Popper. I've done those and. And I'll I get to what I don't like about those, but uh, the there's a new one ish, new ish called Four Horsemen or something like yeah, that. Yeah, they have a yeah, good design one. But I know a couple guys that started fishing those. But anyways, when they when they eat those Menhaden up river, I don't think they have to expend as much energy. So you don't mm-hmm. get those violent like uh, down river on the big bay balls. The, that big blabbermouth will go under so fast it splashes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sometimes. So if you have a, a court that's easier for them to pull under, I think it helps. Yeah, definitely. But that's cool. I think a tangent on that. I can't remember the original question you asked. I, oh, oh, if you're in, it was if you're in shallower water, you popping it lighter, or fishing it in a different way. And here's another question. I thought about this earlier. I'm just firing questions at you because I'm I'm uh, very curious about this. And I I've got one buddy that I lived with in Louisiana, like a popping cork. He thinks about it way too much. Catches a bunch of fish on the popping cork, but like. His retrieve is like, all right, I'm going to hit it real hard and then like a little lighter and then a tit, 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 like, like imagine that fish, here's the big pop, is closing in. I'm giving it some more and more time to find it. I think maybe it's a little too much as far as, but, but you know, if you're going to fish every day, you might as well break it down, that, down to that point. Do you typically just stick to just a pop, let it sit, a pop, let it sit, or or, or you break it down? Yeah. Like I, I think it's like you said. It's like those fish just need to see it. You're, that noise is to key them in on it, and once they see it, they're going to eat it. Yeah. So, is there a specific jig head or soft plastic you like to fish underneath the corner? Um, it doesn't seem to matter a ton, but I, I think you can always, at least mentally, and that that makes a big difference with any kind of fishing, as you know. You can you can fish a little smaller when you're fishing smaller bait. Um, yeah. But uh, there's a little DOA. I mean, I don't only use the DOA airheads, but I've always loved them. Yeah, it's like the perfect size, man. It's big enough to make them want to eat if they're if they're eating like a five inch menhaden or a big one, and then and it's close enough to a a uh, you know a little peanut menhaden. Uh, people use jerk shads. Uh, I've I, you know I use I, so what I what I do use a lot is the five inch diesel men now they come out with those and the Z man and then yeah. the six inch the six inch swimmer Z and um what other one I, well I get the airhead. I think those are the main three. Yeah. Um you don't see them in a lot of tackle shops around here. And I'm not on like DOA's pro pro deal or anything, so I don't if they don't have it at the tackle shops I don't use it. But the five and a half inch jerk side is really good. Yeah. Good size you know that you can get twelve in a pack. It's not that expensive. Yeah, definitely. A quarter. I use a quarter ounce jig head. If there were more jig heads that were eighth ounce with a big hook, I'd probably use some eighth ounce because maybe the fall rate matters. But they, I think they eat it when it's just sitting there. Yeah, definitely. I think you pop it and it falls down, and sometimes they they find it when it's falling and they and they they eat it. But I think a lot of times they find that bait and it's like it's like. The bluefish are eating the men hating in the bait ball, and the other drum are injuring bait. And a lot of the fish, a lot of the they're picking up scraps, picking up dead picking fish. Up, yeah, they're eating the men hating. This is doing this. Yeah, maybe twitching a little bit. That's one of the cool things about the Z mans, though, too, is like you, you pair it up correctly with the right jig head, and and when you let it sit under a cork, it'll sit level. So it would sit yeah. like a suspending bait fish. Does it really matter for big drum? I don't think it does. But they can definitely get get pickier. It seems like at least the cork fishing I've done. Um, 
there's been times where like well and, and this is I mean I've cork fished up there but my most of my experience is Louisiana throwing popping corks yeah. but there'll be some times where they won't touch a cork you'll think there's no fish in an area you go throw a chatter bait or a spinner bait and you'll you know you'll bang 10 fish out of one creek mouth where they wouldn't touch a cork um, yeah so it, it makes you think I think that deeper water that you're fishing in the noose you know being around 10 12 feet on average 15 feet maybe um they have a, they're a little more comfortable. Like the cork's not spooking them like it can in the shallower water sometimes. But uh, yeah. always something to think about. And a lot of people say that they, they don't eat the popping cork in Louisiana anymore because they've just been beat to death with a popping cork. So maybe we'll see that in the Pamlico eventually, but I don't know. <laughs> I know people that are worried about that. I'm not – I don't know. I mean, I, I think by the time they go back out in the ocean and then they get beat up on by the guys at Hatteras with the bucktails, yeah. they've forgotten about the popping corks. And they come <laughs> in and they choose like crazy. Yeah. Now, during that recent amount of time, like a certain week, they can feel the pressure. The boats, the being caught, they get caught. I mean, they'll they'll get caught. A lot of them will get caught multiple times while they're in there. Yeah. Um, they, they they feel the the fishing pressure. Definitely. I don't know if I don't think they really care about the presentation. I think they care more, or like as far as getting spooked and not wanting to bite. I think they the biggest thing, and this will kind of segue. I know you probably have more questions you want to ask, but I did want to talk about... Yeah, yeah, anything. Um, it's like the number one thing that I think about once I start doing the old drum fishing, but I think they feel the fishing pressure, um, with it, whether it be being a lot of them getting caught or the boats buzzing up and down the river or whatever, um, more than anything else. Um, and that kind of leads me to what I wanted to talk about as far as like etiquette out there. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know how many guys you talk to a lot that fish up here a lot for the old drum, uh-huh. but it's really frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a good. This is a good platform, hopefully, to share with some people that that you know m- maybe come up there recreationally. Like, what is perfect etiquette up there on on the noose when you're drum fishing? As far as other anglers, and as also as far as like being cautious of not you know screwing the fish up too much. So I'll lead it with the fact that because there's so many people fishing up there now. If you fish a lot up there, at some point you're going to make a mistake. You know, it, 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 stuff like that happens out there. But um, it's pretty common knowledge, all these areas that people like to fish for old drum. I mean, you can get a chart of the Noose River on your chart plotter. You can get a paper chart, and you can get one that highlights all the good spots. I mean, Gar Bacon Shoal. Right. Gum, light, I mean, p- people know where people are drum fishing. If, if, you, if you're out there fishing... You know, you can't really do too much about the power boaters that are just booze cruising. I mean, I wish they would know, but the guys that are fishing. You, you, you're coming up, you're going by, or you're coming up to fish in a likely area. First of all, you should be approaching from upwind. If it's if it's blowing, I mean, a lot of time, we get a lot of slick calm days in August and early September, but you should be approaching from from upwind, so you're not cutting people off, um, and you should imagine these areas as a as a large zone and not a spot um and kind of kind of think if you see if whether there's one guy out there or none or or 10 boats in a general area kind of draw a, a circle or an oval or whatever the area that they're in and then the the, the area they're fishing like could be garbage and shoal whatever and and don't go anywhere near that with your outboard uh go if you're going to go buy it or say you just finished your drift and you're going to go back around, what I do is I troll the motor out until I get a decent bit away from other boats or the, the bait. I'm, I'm going to keep fishing if I'm still seeing bait, but I'll troll the motor out a little bit, then idle out, and I'll go way downwind, and then I'll pick up and run way out offshore or inshore. It just depends on how far the fish are out the shoal. If the fish are way out the end of the shoal, I'll go shallow. And you go way around. And run, I run. I'll get back on, on plane. Run around, and you get way upwind, and then you idle in, troll the motor in, and then you start fishing. Yeah. Never turn your motor on around around the fish or whatever. But, yeah, I mean, think of them as these large zones. You don't want to go in there with the outboard because these fish, they definitely feel the fishing pressure. Yeah. I mean, I don't care. I mean, in the ocean, they're really stupid and aggressive. I mean, you can drive right up on top of them. I don't know what it is, but, I mean, they don't seem to care that much in the ocean when I see them out there. But in the noose, they feel the pressure. There's people targeting them. It's shallower. They're getting ready to start spawning. Um there's bull sharks in there chasing them. I mean, yeah. I don't know what it is, but they definitely don't. I mean, I've seen I've seen people come in there on plane and drop down and kill a bite where you have like 12 bites in in 15 minutes and then nothing. Yeah. Nothing. So 
Yeah. So when you see when you when, definitely when you see other guys out pushed off the shoreline, standing on their bow this time of year, you know what they're doing. Don't run near them, anywhere near them. I mean, hundreds of yards away, you shouldn't be driving around. Right. Go around them or join them. I mean, you, if, I don't care if you come fish the area I'm fishing as long as you start upwind of me, don't use your motor, get in there quietly, you know, do, you know, whatever. And also the guys that are doing it out there with no trolling motor, I hate to say it, but you don't need to be fishing near other people if, if it's a calm day with no wind drift. If there's a wind drift, you wind drift through and you're good. Yeah. If there's no wind, you don't need to be fishing near other people. You can idle up to your own bait ball you find somewhere down river or up river from the other people or where where there's not other people, but you don't need to be idling up to the bait balls other people are fishing. Right, right. You're just hurting everybody else by doing that. And yourself. But yeah, I mean, and yourself. Around you, then, I mean, I'm not going to tell somebody they, they shouldn't go out there and fish. I mean, I'd want everybody to go out there and catch this fish, but... I don't. You just have to think about what you're doing when you're out there. Just yeah, think. definitely, definitely. I, I, and I think it's a great place to I the choir to you, but <laughs> no, I, I I completely agree with you. Um, and and that that's one of those fisheries where yeah, you can fish. It's a cool it's a cool way to fish because you know you can go fish beside a couple of your other buddies on different boats throughout the day and not mess each other up, have a fun time. But following those simple kind of steps and rules is is very key, very key. So um, is there a certain speed on the trolling motor that you feel like affects those fish or you can kind of rip that trolling motor around and not worry too much about them it, it, that's a good question because uh if sometimes you have to use more trolling motor yeah voltage like if like uh you can feel what you can kind of get to feel what get the feel for it like last year for whatever reason we had all these slick calm days and and even some of the windier days last year the the scattered bait wind drifts and, and fan casting just wasn't working for me. I barely caught any fish like that like I have in the past. Yeah. It was all get that cork right on that bait ball and those were like some of the only bites we were getting. Really? So some of those days we burn up the trolling motor and it's like you have to. Um, and if you're on a wind drift and you got these scattered bait balls scattered everywhere and you you got this wind drift going straight and the bait balls over, you see a bait ball coming downwind of you but it's off to your port side You just you just kind of troll the motor really hard to your port instead of going straight at the bait ball you just go side to the wind yeah yeah and try to wind of it and then just drift with and once you get you know upwind of it you drift to it cast to it so trying um, to let the wind take like yeah. the, the closing that last distance to the bait ball you want to be using as much wind as possible as opposed to using trolling motor. yeah 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 so use it as be as, as sneaky as, as possible <laughs> that's yeah. pretty much what it boils down to <laughs> We're, we're uh, breaking it down maybe too much. We're going to go over to that bait ball and go over to this bait ball. But, yeah, use it as minimalistic as possible. Just like, uh, you know, I hate to, you know, I hate to use this analogy all the time. But just like when you're, I mean, I know you probably don't use the trolling motor as much as I do on your flats boat. But, oh, I'm using it more and more every day. <laughs> <laughs> but you, 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 you do the same thing. You yeah. Know, you you, you want to go fish over there. You got the wind at your back. You're going to kind of troll a motor to the point where you can drift in there and power pole down or, or stake out or whatever you do. I don't, do you have a power pole? No power pole. I need one. I'm being cheap. Well, you can stake out or yeah, whatever. Yeah, stake out. And, uh, and you don't want to use it too much. Um, right. Someday, when it's really calm, I think it makes a bigger difference. For sure. For sure. It does make some, I mean, it makes some noise down there. It does make some noise. It does. And one thing I've noticed too, sight fishing redfish for off the trolling motor is if you, it's all about consistency in your noise. Like, you know, pounds, like you drop a cooler lid or something like that, that's going to spook a fish. But that light hum, if, if I, I, I can be running at a three right up to a fish, catch, cast to him and eat it. But so many times I've idled up to a fish on my trolling motor you know, killed the trolling motor 30 feet out and fish spooks as soon as I kill the trolling motor. So it's that change in noise. Uh, I've heard, I have heard that from people that know a lot about old, specifically old drum, but just fish like slot red fish in general too. But like George Beckwith told me that. Yeah. Uh, he said that, you know, years ago before the pop and court thing got popular, people were trying to target them day in and day out with, with lures. They would, they would, you know, run into them in schools out there, and and George never had a trolling motor until like a couple of years ago. They they the bigger boats they go out to the sound and they yeah. they bait fish a lot, but they would find these situations where they could present flies lures to them. And he said that you could, I mean, even in the Noose River, you could you could idle around, just don't turn your motor off or don't be have your motor off and then turn it on. Yeah, no, yeah, and it's that don't, change. Don't change the RPMs. Yeah, idle. 
Yeah. There's one so, back yeah. there. Gonna throw. <laughs> no, no. I guess you could turn around too. You don't have to. Don't have to go in reverse. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, I think that that's one thing I've learned a lot is even it, when I'm not sight fishing, but I'm in an area that feels like there's fish in there. You know, I'll try to creep my trolling motor down if I've got to cut it off. Or, uh, or or just keep it running and do like a big wide turn or something and, and come back and yeah, drift in. About, I never thought about slowly backing the, the thrust off of the trolling motor. That's a good point. Yeah, just kind I, of slowly I, transition I, I, out. You're going up and throttle. I always thought about that, but then the thrust or whatever. I've never thought about backing it off slowly. That makes sense. I, it's happened multiple times. I'd say more than a dozen times where I've been, you know, on, by myself on the front of the boat, trolling motor up. You know, I see a fish on a bank. Kill the trolling motor, boom! Fish spooks off thirty feet away. You know, so they definitely key in on that. And the deeper, yeah. the deeper the water in, for any fish, I feel like the more comfortable they are. I don't care if it's a, a freaking permit or a redfish or a tarpon or what it is. I think they're more comfortable generally. Um, but it doesn't mean those same principles don't apply. You know, in the deeper water as well. So, um, and these are all things that maybe it's too much. But if you want to become a better angler and break something down and and try to catch more fish, it's all stuff to think about. You know what I mean? <laughs> So that's what I tell people too. Is, is it, if some of the stuff might not matter as much, but if you do it every day, you're going to be more consistent day in and day out. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you got to stack the odds in your favor. Exactly. Well, man, is there any other uh, you know stuff you want to touch on as far as the old drum fishing goes? We're at about 45, 46 minutes, and uh, we can keep rolling if you got anything. But if not, man, that was a bunch of really good information. I think people are going to appreciate it. And, and you can apply this not just at the noose, anywhere in the Pamlico, anywhere where you've got big red fish and under 20 feet of water, um, whether you're in Mississippi, Louisiana, Florida, Texas, like all these principles apply anywhere that you're targeting these fish. So, um, I think, uh, sorry. That cut. No, no, you're good. I was done. I was done. I'm really good at rambling, so sometimes you just got to cut me off. <laughs> Um, well, I think because of, you know, we're on your podcast and the listeners are probably people that are, you know, if they're listening to this podcast, they're either avid followers of you or they want to learn about old drum fishing or whatever. Right, right. Um, the, they want to know, like, how can I get better at it? The, how, how, do I, how do I learn how to do this? How do I catch them? Just got to grind, man. Yeah. You got it. You're gonna spend the first. Like I imagine, a lot of your listeners, if they're if they're like listening to it because they're gonna gear up and go, um, do it, do the old drum fishing. The first season you do it, you might not catch that many. Right. Right. Um, but what kind of fishing have we all done? And we just the first year we did it, we did, were good at it. Nothing. Nothing. It, it <laughs> takes at least not the kind of fishing you're gonna appreciate. I mean, it takes that learning that that learning curve and. That's what I like about this podcast is I feel like you're, we're giving people tools to go out there being successful. And, and my big argument to some people that are like, why are you sharing information with people? I'm like, the more conservation or the more people that we have out there recreationally fishing that are successful, the more conservation-minded people are going to have out there. They're going to care about the resource more. So that's kind of my whole push behind this whole thing. Um, you know, other than, you know, hopefully I'll book, you'll book some trips from stuff like this. I'll book some trips from stuff like this. But really, I just want people to understand the resource we have here the beauty of the resource and and how it needs us to survive so yeah um, and i mean even you know conservation aside uh well not conservation aside but like not even talking about people getting into like cca and and yeah, that kind yeah. of thing. but uh like you said of getting people to appreciate it more it, there's less people that are getting into fishing less people that are teaching their kids so there's a lot of people that are going out there and they're not bringing the values of caring about the resource into it. There's a lot of people, I hate to say it, but there's a lot of people that are just doing it kind of for some glory or whatever. Right. I and mean, there's an element of that with everybody. Everybody wants to beat their chest a little bit. Right. Caught some big fish, but you need to value it and mm -hmm. take care of it and like wet your hands when you catch that and you're going to release that speckled trout, you know? Yeah. And uh, uh, don't try to catch these old drum on trout tackle. I mean, it happens, but dude, I had that, if you have good stuff, you're out there in the noose, popping a cork probably should probably shouldn't be using a 1000 <laughs> you probably should be ready to put five six seven pounds of drag on the fish right you don't want to out there with two pounds of drag and shit <laughs> you know? so that, that's enough i mean that's taking care of the fish get them in quick or whatever i mean i you know some guys have told me that the with some of the post-release mortality stuff they did with the old drum that the length of the fight wasn't the killer it was mainly when they would get deep gut hooked and it would lacerate an internal organ, that was like the only thing that could kill them. But I can't hurt. Like, when those guys, I hear these guys that are like out there 
fighting them for like an hour. You don't need to fight a redfish for an hour. They no. tire themselves out. They tire they themselves out. You should have a redfish in the boat in five minutes. Dude, I had the freaking one that I caught the other day on the my little trout rod at the boat in four minutes. Yeah, yeah. And on a big rod that, that's set up for that fish, a minute and a half is a is a is a you know, an average yeah. fight, what it should be. We're landing fifty plus inch redfish in three to five minutes max. Yeah. Yeah. That that's I mean, it's really that, a fight though. Yeah. People think that's not a fight. Time yourself when you fight a decent sized fish. You're landing them quicker than you think. You, you know? really are, yeah. Yeah, uh, you should if you're on the correct tackle, and the, the water's warm in there. I mean, it's definitely important. Is there any anything that uh, kind of comes to your mind as far as handling those fish when you do get them to the boat? Uh, I mean, uh, just like anything else, you do want to handle them as little as possible. Like, um, I try to get everybody a hero shot um, because that's what they want, you know, of course. And then after that, you know, some people want to get a couple hero shots of a couple fish, but you would you can go ahead and D hook them at the side of the boat. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I'm tagging them though. So these days, so I'm bringing most of them in the boat and tagging them. But bring in the boat, tag it, measure it. You don't have to write everything down right then. Get them back in the water. You know. Yeah. If you're gonna take a picture, you go think, put it in the water. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Um, don't drop them on their head. I've heard that kills them. What about holding them by the gills? Oh, that. Yep. The- I know that's probably what you want to be. No, don't no, no. I just, I just thought about it now. Don't hold them by the gills, probably, especially big fish. Yeah, yeah. I, I, just, from what I understand, they, they're not really meant to be held, held vertically, anyways, with their organs and everything. They're not even supposed to be. I mean, they're not supposed to probably even feel the same amount of gravity we feel at right, all. Right, right. Less turn vertically like this with everything going down towards their tail. Well, you get one new thing. You get your hands all up in there. If you know what you're doing, and you slide your hand in there a little bit just to like help you lift them, and you do that, and then grab the fish and. You know, you can do that, but don't hold them up their whole weight by the gills because you'll damage the the actual, like, flesh there, and you could damage the gill structures. Um, you know, I don't know if – I've done it in the past, but I didn't know what I was doing. Right, right. We all, Everybody has. I still, I still don't know what I'm doing with some things. I mean, whatever. <laughs> A lot of things. Yeah, but same here. I have held heavy fish in the past when I was younger, and you can feel the – you can feel that – I don't know what you call it, but the corner right there. You can like that cartilage and flesh kind of tear a little bit? Yeah, your fan goes, and you know, anytime that you take slime coat scales, you damage a fish, they could get infections and lesions and all that stuff. So, not good. Yeah, not good. Well, right on, man. Well, thank you for that. I think that's uh, it's got me fired up to come up there and, and do some uh, old drum fishing. Hopefully, some other people. And um, definitely, I mean, it's a fun place to go fish by yourself. But but give Will a call if you want to get up there and do some old drum fishing. I, hopefully, he's still got a few open dates and, and can get some of y'all out there. But um, Give him a call soon. I know that stuff books up up there pretty quickly, and uh, go catch you some big fifty-inch redfish. What's the What's the biggest fish you've personally had to your boat up there? Not you, like just client or you or or, or whatnot. Honestly, man, I don't measure them that much. You don't have you? Do you ever hang them on a boga for weight? I have in the past, and not with like a really big one, like you know something like a little over thirty. But yeah, yeah. I've I've yeah. caught. It's hard to say which one, the biggest one I've caught, but you know we catch them to like 55 inches. That's that's about as big as I've caught, probably yeah. 53, 55, something like that. Um, pretty big. Yeah, pretty freaking big. <laughs> they're, yeah. I think Once they're over 40, man, they're freaking big fish. That, so. Yeah. So I mean, it, it's really cool to talk about like the biggest one or whatever, but I try not to get into it too much with my customers and and even my friends. I take fishing is like. Nobody wants to post a picture of their 45 inch redfish on Facebook and somebody just post in the comments, look at my 56 incher. Right. Dude, well, fish are all, you can't choose which size it is. Right, I mean, they're all big. Inch, the 35 incher is the smallest one I've caught while old jump fishing, besides like a couple slots that I caught, like fishing a spot close to the bank, you know. But when I'm yeah. out there off the bank a little bit where there's not going to be any slot drum and you're catching that class of fish, the breeders, I caught a 35 inch one cast. And a forty nine and a half the next cast. Well, yeah, so they're just hanging in there together. They're just all schooled up, same size. They're, they're different they're sizes. Old, I mean, yeah, a lot of people wouldn't call it thirty five inch or an old drum, they call it a yearling, but um <laughs> they're over forty inches, dude, they're all awesome. Some are just better than others. And some of those forty two inch bucks they fight better than the fifty five inch. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I mean it's all about the fight and the the the, the when you first hook them, I mean, it's like you know. Oh yeah. When that when that, 
goes down and you, you probably caught them other ways, but when the court goes down and you're real tight on them and that thing just takes off, dude, that's the best so, part right it's there. It's so fun. And I, cool the blabbermouth see. splashing back up when it goes under, I'm excited to see that too. I haven't fished the blabbermouths at all. I've got a couple, but I've always just fished those, those paradise poppers or some other ones, but... Cool. Uh, I'm gonna order one of those uh, four horsemen's or whatever the big one and uh, try some of those because they're they're, they're the mouse are great and everything but they're a little clumsy and a little they're heavy yeah you know work yeah I just had a lot of customers that were not able to pop it hard enough and make a big enough explosion on those like blind casting fan casting type of days mm-hmm. um, and I it, I think it was inhibiting their their bites because I'd see like the next guy popping it harder and doing the same cast. And five to one. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that's I started fishing those, but, um, the, and also the, the little bombers and everything, they would get like a little crater in the bottom. Yeah. Actually, 100, 500 times, they get a little crater. <laughs> right. And then right. they lay sideways. And then instead of going like this, boom, they just go. They kind of skip. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, letting that yeah, thing yeah. stand. That's a good point. Letting that thing stand up before you pop it really is what throws that water dead. So, yeah. well, sweet man. <laughs> we'll have to. Uh, we'll have to have you back I on. And t- stuff to say. Yeah, I, well, we're at an hour, man. We we crushed it. We crushed yeah. it. Well, and we'll have to have you back on and, and talk false albacore up there. Talk false albacore in here before. But I think talking about the Cape Lookout fishery would be cool. Um, would be a good good one yeah. to talk about. So. Uh, well, sweet. Well, uh, I appreciate it, and uh, I'm gonna close her out here. I'll switch back over to my camera. Yeah, I've, had, I've had it on you this whole time. So, um, well, guys, <laughs> thanks for checking out uh, this Eastern Current episode. Hope y'all learned a little bit. And like I said, you can apply this anywhere that you're fishing for large redfish. Here we call them old drum in North Carolina, but bull redfish is a common name in a lot of other places. Uh, don't call them. Redfish. Don't call them redfish. <laughs> no, don't call them bull reds because uh, a bull red. In other states, could be like a 33 or 35 or something. That's true. That's Old very drum, true. Probably much bigger than that. Old drummer over 45 inches, right? Or over 40 inches. Well, over, over like 40 or so. Gotcha. Like 40 or so. <laughs> so old drums they, they, over they 40 or so. Like that. Yeah. yeah. Get them another like that, but average size is bigger here. Average size is definitely bigger in North Carolina and, and north of North Carolina. Like your big redfish in Louisiana are, way, are like the smaller redfish in North Carolina as far as the big – so many, there's all these nuances to it all, but y'all get what I'm saying. Well, guys, thanks for checking it out, and I will, uh, I'll see y'all next week in the next episode. Later.